So as you remember, it was an incredible time between Paul and Barnabas. It was an amazing time where they went through some tough times in order to continue on. And we visited that, actually a little bit more than visited it, we went into a little bit of a deeper perspective of how God continues to work no matter what the situation looks like through our eyes. And though these two mighty men of God argued and had a heated discussion over their disagreements, the work of the Lord continued on. It doesn't stop. And so I encourage you in remembering that to think about that as we go into chapter 16 because you'll be able to see what, no problem, thank you. You'll be able to see where, uh, what, what the word reveals to chance. Alright, so uh, again, God works even in those difficult situations. He's still at work. God doesn't say, all right, the world is going to stop until you become perfect. How many know that's never going to happen? Well, it's not going to happen until we get there. So, realize God is, His ways and His thoughts are so much higher than ours. He's perfect in His ways. So He can be, work, work, we may not be in the best situation, but He's working on us, in us, and uh, you know, through us. He's working. And it continues, even in days when we're not doing uh, the best we can be. Uh, and that's what we see, taking it into chapter 16. Barnabas takes John Mark. They, continue, they go on continuing to encourage the churches in another direction. Paul, he, the Bible says he picks Silas and they begin their journey to go encourage the other churches that were started. And from there, chapter 16, verse 1, this is what the Bible says. Then he, talking about Paul, came to Derby, and to Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there, named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra, and I quote him, verse 3, Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Verse 4, As they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Verse 7. And they had come to uh, Messiah. They tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So now after he had seen the vision, immediately we stopped to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. That's the first ten verses. We're going to stop right there because there's just no way we're going to get past that. But we want to take a look at what we can. Now, again, we, we're looking at it from, uh, the, say, the camera of the Holy Spirit. Allowing us to follow the work of the Lord through Paul and through Silas. And so it starts by, the, the scripture tells us that Paul goes into Derby, into Lystra. And, and when he goes into Derby and Lystra, he runs into a disciple. Now, here's, here's what's interesting about this. The Bible says that, behold, a certain disciple was there. Now, just reading that, there's already a lot to look at. And, and so, let's touch it a little bit. There's already a disciple. It's interesting to me that the Bible makes this clear. Paul doesn't go to uh, Derby and Lystra and, and win this soul to the Lord and begin to disciple him. 
When he gets there, this young man is already a disciple. He's already loving God and serving God. And so uh, that's a, a powerful thing. Well, we can just read a couple more verses and tie this part together because we need to see, and God wants us to see this. That's why it's written here. He wants us to see these details. Uh, check it out. Behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed when his father was Greek. There's a detail there we're going to cover in a minute. <clears throat> he was well spoken of by brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So Paul shows up with Silas. They're there doing the work, encouraging the churches, and there's a young man there. And first of all, we see that Paul notices that this guy loves God. That this guy is a disciple. So Paul notices it. And so the scripture gives us an, an interesting detail. Uh, as we said already, he's already a disciple. He's already believing. But we have to ask this question. What does the Bible tell us as to how he became a believer? How did he become a believer? How did he become a disciple? See, it's one thing to say, I believe in God. It's another thing to say, I follow Christ. How many of you have ever met somebody who says, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, but they don't actually live for God? Yeah, anybody ever met someone like that? Amen. Amen. There's a difference. That's what you call said faith. Faith that's just words. They just talk it out. They just say it, but it doesn't show up in their actions. Well, that's how Paul ran into. He ran into a young guy. This guy was really young. Timothy, uh, according to this, this study, he conceived that he was young. But we don't really know his, his exact age, but he's a young guy. But there's something about his life that stood out quickly, and Paul noticed it immediately. I don't want to pass that up without saying this. What a testimony it is, folks, when other people can see a living relationship with God in your life. Amen. What a testimony when someone who never met you, who just walks up and starts to meet people and see people, spots you out and says, there's something different about that person. That person loves God and you can tell. Even more than that, that person is a disciple. Think about that for a moment. That's a powerful testimony. Imagine in your family, your co-workers, your neighbors, even your old friends. Notice I said your old friends. Come on. You still love them? They still know you? But let me ask you, do some of those old friends see in you what they need to see? Or when they look at you, do they say, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, they go to church, but I don't see it. <laughs> do the old friends say, hey, that's the same old, same old, same chuck and chive, same cussing, same temper, same attitude. Was it supposed to be me or nothing? Just, you know. <laughs> Come on. We're good. We're good. But think about it. What a testimony this young man has for a man of God to walk in and begin to, to, to meet, greet, and talk with the people and spot this. You know what he spots? Is he spots his relationship with God. He sees it in his actions. He sees it in his life. So, again, you can't pass that. And I want that. I want that so desperately. And I hope you want that. I hope every single one of us want to be able to, to show Jesus to the world. I say it often, and I mean, I think I end every service with it. Shine the light. Right? Shine the light. Go in this dark world, wherever your part of the dark world is, and shine the light. What light? The light of Jesus. The fact that Jesus is inside of you and you are a light bearer. I remember one of my uh, son's friends used to always wear this t-shirt. I loved it. It was a t-shirt and it had a moon on it. It said, be the moon. And then on the back it said, reflect the sun. If you know anything about the stars and the moon and all that, if you know anything about it, the moon doesn't have any light. The only reason it looks like light is because the sun hits the moon and we see the light reflecting off of the moon and it, it's so bright it even makes it seem like it's 
giving light itself and light, lighting up the darkness. Isn't that right? Well, I think we are more like the moon than we are the sun. Jesus is the sun. He's the source of light. He's the source of change and love and truth and wisdom. You and I, we reflect him. So when people see us, they need to see Jesus working in us. I never said this. I never will say it. They don't need to see us perfect because we're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. But I can tell you right now, even in our imperfections, the light of Christ can show. Amen. It can show. And you know how it best shows? When people knew you before and they know you now. You used to be a giant turkey before and now you're not. You know, what is that, a giant turkey? It's something that we used to call people in the 60s and 70s. I still did it in the 80s, and I'm still doing it in 2018 because I just don't know how to move forward. I'm not hip. I'm not cool. I don't know the new words, and I don't care. <laughs> That's why. What you used to be, you are not anymore. Why? Because this relationship you have with God is affecting you, and it's showing in your actions, and other people are noticing it, and it gets to the place where others may honor God because of it, or even they might say, I want what you have. Because it is special. Shine the light. Well, I don't know if Timothy really knew that he was being watched. Just like I don't think we always realize that we're being watched. Did you notice? Have you ever noticed that you're being watched? Uh -huh. Gosh, I see I have a big mouth. <laughs> and because I have a big mouth, even if I wasn't being watched, Something will come out of my mouth that will indicate that I'm a follower of Christ. Next thing you know, got people watching my steps and see what he does, and see what he says. Ooh, let's see. I have been driving in cars with people watching me, and we're driving down the street. Look out, man! Here it comes. We're driving down the street, and. Something walking down the street. Quite beautiful. And I'm literally going, I already know what's going to happen. This guy is going to watch where, I, where my eyes go. I already know. I'm driving, and I look outside of my head. They're like, uh huh. Uh huh. What? Fixing my face? You know, what are you talking about? You be watched. You're being you're under the microscope. And usually it's from those who aren't sure you've changed yet. They want to see. What are you really like? How how are you really? Are you really what you say you are? Wow, I didn't mean for tonight to be so quiet. <laughs> but how many know? We need those kinds of reminders. We are being watched. I'm enjoying it right now at work, guys. It's tiring, it's hard, but I am enjoying it. Because I'm starting to have fellowship with my coworker. And I didn't know whether he believed in the Lord at all, but we're starting to have fellowship. We're starting to freely talk about God again. And it's only a matter of time. And I'm going to be careful, because he might start to watch YouTube and I don't want him to ever feel, or them to ever feel uncomfortable because I love them and I'm so glad to, to be there. But like I said, we got to shine that light yeah. and realize we're being watched even when we don't think we're being watched. I got to say one more thing about that and we move on. And that's this. Parents, grandparents, we're not just being watched from the left and the right co-workers, neighbors, friends, fellow church members. We're being watched by our kids as well. And our grandkids. Oh, Pastor, Papa don't talk like that when you're around. <laughs> oh, who's your Papa? Let me go meet your Papa. <laughs> or your Papa, or however your grandkids call her, right? Oh no, you should hear him. <laughs> He loves them. 
He loves the, the, the game so much he yells at the TV. I don't know, the words aren't Jesus' words, Pastor. <laughs> we get watched from every direction. And so back to the story. Paul comes in, sees Timothy, he's a disciple. He is already walking with God. And so we must see, who did God use? How did God bring this young man to faith? Well, we, we will we'll visit other places in Scripture later, like the letters to Timothy. First and second Timothy. It's the same Timothy we're talking about today. But just staying in the chapter here, uh, the Scripture gives us an interesting uh, detail. It says that this disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. It gives us that detail. A Jewish woman who believed. But then it gives us this other detail. And that is, but his father was Greek. Now, if you, if you just read it just like that and don't know anything else about it, that can seem really vague and a little hard to understand. But uh, let's just pick it apart for a second. First of all, the scripture tells us that his mother believed. She was a Jewish woman who believed. So we know she came from that place of, the, of believing and walking under the law. Uh, and now she's under grace, but she is still a Jewish woman. She now believes that Jesus is the Messiah and is now following Jesus. And so somewhere along the line, excuse me, Timothy, her son, gets taught that Jesus is Lord. Amen. Timothy is half Jew, half Greek. And the Bible says, it, it's interesting, it's like a contrast. Mom believed, but dad was Greek. It's kind of weird. That would be like saying, like, I need a bread, right? Mom believed, but dad was a Latino. <laughs> How does that work? Is that saying all Latinos don't believe? No. All Greeks don't believe? No. There's something about the way it is written that helps us understand there is a contrast. Mom's Jewish and believes he's a Gentile. And I think we need to fill in the blank. It's possible that he did not believe. And the way we further get that is when you study the life of Timothy, you don't read how his dad was there working with him, teaching him the ways of Jesus. As a matter of fact, you don't read anything about his dad other than that. And he was Greek. I'm not going to pass up that detail, folks. Even if we only get to the verse tonight. See, that touches me specifically. As you guys know my testimony, my father left when I was four years old. I didn't, was raised with a father, like many people today. I didn't have the influence of a father. I know what that is. And you'll be surprised how many people will make the excuse, oh, because I don't have a father. Or I don't have a mother. That's why I'm the way I am, and I'm not going to change for anybody. Why are you going to change for Jesus? Because there is no greater father than our Lord God. And there is no greater mother than Almighty God. He is everything to us. And when human beings let you down, God does not let you down. He is our good, good father. That's right. It's who he is. We sing about that, right? It's who he is. And we're loved by him. That's who I am. Amen. There is no real excuse. And the Bible supports that. Now, I'm not making light of the pain we go through. Uh, but I found over the years as an adult is there was a lot of undeveloped areas in my life that I didn't even realize until I started serving God and getting wisdom. I started realizing, wow, well, I should have learned that as a kid. But Pop wasn't around, so I didn't learn that. I learned something else. I learned something stupid. Well, am I the only one that learned something stupid? <laughs> I was like, what? Did you just say that? Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't learn what I was supposed to. I learned stupid stuff. By all the other guys in our house, all the other people in our house that didn't know God and wanted to, to influence little kids into doing things they shouldn't do. That's how I learned atheism. That's how I did drugs at an early age. That's how I was getting busted driving a car when I was using a telephone book under me to look big. So I looked like an adult when I was driving. 
I was nine years old when I got busted doing that. Most kids at nine years old are, are playing G.I. Joe's and <laughs> stuff, at least when I was growing up. Anyway, the, the scripture tells us that this disciple who was impressive in his walk wasn't trying to be, wasn't worried about the fact that he was being watched, probably, probably wasn't, wasn't aware of it. But he was, and it was impressive his walk and the detail that is so beautiful. And here's why i got to give it up for the, the believing mothers. The Bible says dad wasn't around, or at least he was, he was I, it's just a weird way it's written. But mom believed. Don't ever think you can't make impact. Oh, but pastor, we are in a different time now. Our, our kids are rebellious, and they're here, and they're this, and they're that. they got the internet. I'm up against a lot of, a lot more of the enemy. So are you saying that God has become weaker? Are you saying that there is evil today that God didn't know about and he can't get you through and he can't help you do what you need to do with your kids? Is that what we're saying? Let God be true and every man a liar. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. Where, where you can't do it, God knows and he's merciful and loving. Where you can't do it, he can't. Do it through you. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. And so props to the believing moms. You keep shining that light. Because you might have a son or a daughter. You may have a Timothy in your house. And just because they, they haven't done it yet. They haven't made a commitment to Christ. It doesn't mean it's not coming. Props to the believing moms. Did the believing moms in the house? Come on now. Amen. You have got your work cut out, no question. But who, who's to say you won't have a Timothy in your lineup? Oh, and Timothy became one of the youngest pastors. And his life is written about in Scripture. Think about it. Mom was a believer, but dad was Greek. <laughs> that just floors me when you read it that way. It's like, what? But, Again, we'll get into more of that later. And, and uh, you know, some of you who already know some of the scripture you've been studying a little longer, you know that it wasn't just mom. Wasn't there someone else who was also helping disciple Timothy? How many of you, show me your hand if you know there was someone else beside mom helping disciple? You know, enough of you didn't lift your hand, so good. I get to tell you. You know who else was helping disciple? His grandma. Mama. Nana was a disciple of the two. See, Mom said, Timothy, you can't be doing that. Why can't I? What? And Nana will come in with her. You better be listening to your mother. Okay, Nana. Come on. Is that how it worked in here? Or was it opposite? It was an opposite. Mom was like, you know what? And Nana was like, here's a candy. <laughs> you know that. Props to the believing grandmas. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Don't take those things lightly. They're in Scripture for a reason. To encourage us. To uplift us. To help us believe for what we might think is the impossible. You might have somebody that's impossible in your life right now. It's just impossible. You want to shake them. You're impossible. God says to you, oh, but his name or her name might end up being Timothy one day. So don't give up. Keep on doing what you know is right. Teach them. Oh, what an incredible testimony. How many followers so far? Are you listening? Amen. Amen. And so uh, let, let's continue on with this because he's being watched. Verse 2 says, he was well spoken of by brethren who are in Lystra and Iconium. His testimony was strong enough that other people were testifying about it. The scripture does not say that Paul went and said, hey, hey, come here, come here. See that kid over there? What are you talking about? You don't read that in scripture. Yet, people in Lystra and Iconium were speaking well of Timothy. They had good things to say. It was a blessing 
what they were saying about this young man. And at the end of the day, Timothy would come up and give him a 20 spot. <laughs> I gotta let you guys know something for those of you who don't know that I do that once in a while. I'll throw something so wacky out there like that because you'll be surprised how many people aren't paying attention. <laughs> I remember a long time ago, I'll never forget, my pastor, Pastor Ray, who I see him at Ben's discipleship one day. And it blessed me to see him. Just really blessed me to see him. I was a young disciple. I'll never forget it. Me and a few other disciples. And what is this one disciple, man, he just, this guy, good man, really good man. Pastor Ray was preaching, and the brother just conked out. Now, if you can speak in church, it happens. I do. We all, it happens, so don't feel convicted or anything. Just, there's a difference between you're tired, busy day, or that, and you just, I'm bored, man. There's a difference. And so, Pastor's preaching, and the guy is right there, just out, man, whatever. And so, Pastor said, and you know what? You're all going to hell. And he, he didn't really catch it. He goes, amen! <laughs> right at the wrong time. Can you imagine that? Amen! Everybody was like, what? What? I go, you can go on that going. <laughs> Talk about not paying attention. So you guys have really been around while I know that every once in a while I'm gonna scroll the scripture on purpose and I'll wait to see. <laughs> so Timothy goes and he says, hey, thanks for talking good about me. Here's a 20 spot. Paul should know this thing by now. <laughs> Is that how it went? No, because no, he didn't he, that's not what he was doing. He was serving God. His life spoke. In such ways that people in Lystra and Iconium would were just sharing about how good this young man is. Yeah. His testimony. And how can I pass that up without thinking about and saying, what does our testimony, does our life, does it shine bright enough that others would confirm it? Others would confirm it. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, I believe it's in the book of Proverbs, it says, let another man praise you. You ever heard that verse? Yeah. Let another man praise you. In other words, don't praise yourself, don't toot your own horn, don't walk around advertising yourself, don't walk around uh, boasting about what you can do, what you can capable of, and, and look at me and catch, let me get your attention. The Bible says, let another man praise you. Let someone else speak of the good things you are and the good things you can do, the things that God's done in your life. Let that happen. Why? Because when that happens, it comes from their heart. And it's, it's a thousand percent true because they see God working in you. Yes. Think about that. Well, does our testimony stretch so far that other people even share it. You know, a testimony can go two ways, you know. It can go good and bad. We don't want it stretching bad. Oh, yeah, you don't know that, brother. In church, he's great, but outside of here, <laughs> yeah, our testimonies can go one of two ways. In Timothy's life, it was Jesus all the way. His life was changing. It was growing. And it said, Jesus. And I wonder, I wonder if, if, if that's what's going on in our life. I think I shared this testimony. I'll share it again. When I was, when I was a young believer, I got saved when I was 17 years old, served God for a while. And uh, I, I was overconfident. I thought myself stronger than I was. And so I would go hang out with my old friends because I wanted to win them to the Lord. It was, it was too early. Too, I was too young. I wasn't strong enough. And in a weak moment, way back, in a weak moment, um, they were partying and drinking. And my friends kept telling me, ah, we want the old Tony back. The new Tony's boring, man. To get him out of here. We want the old Tony. And in a moment of weakness and, and, and just loneliness, and that was really, you know, wasn't it? 
I had overconfidence in myself. I thought, I can handle this, and I started hanging out with the old friends before it was time. And I remember one of my friends walks up, puts a beer in my hand. He says, come on, just one, just one for old times. And I'm like, all right. And he stood there watching me the whole thing. And after I was done, I put it down. He looked at me and he said, now, don't ever preach to me again. Don't ever come here preaching Jesus changed you, and you're different. Don't ever do that again. I walked out like that. You feel that? Did you feel that? How oh, that ugly that would feel? How oh, horrible. I did that. I know what that feels like. But I can testify to you that about two years later, because I that that shook me. It, it, that shook my life so good. I felt so bad about it that I got my my life straight. I started walking with God and I was able to let go of everything and, and really just keep going forward. And about two years later, I remember some of those friends started visiting the church and uh, I think it was my pastor that asked them, hey, so, so, you know, what's he like when he's outside of here? And uh, they said, well, and the report got back to me. This is what they said. You know, there was a time when but now we believe he's the real deal. He's a real believer. You know how blessed I felt to hear that. Amen. That what I my testimony that I ruined, God restored. Amen. But I testify this to you because I know what it is to have my testimony go further out to where other people are saying bad things. And then I also learned, if you give it all to God, that testimony book will go out and people will start saying good things. Amen. They'll confirm that Jesus is real in your life. Amen. That you really are serving God. That your life has changed. You're not that same old giant turkey. I don't mean to be calling you a giant turkey man. It's just, <laughs> we're just not those people anymore. We still have our weaknesses. We still struggle. We're fighting the good fight, learning, growing, changing. But there is a clear evidence of change. And it's not fake. It's not a show to convince other people. It's just you loving God, living for God, and people realize it. They see something happen to you. How many of you want a testimony like that? Amen. All right. Let's give the Lord a hand clap tonight if we can. So I'm, I'm going to close it at this point. Can you believe it? 822? <laughs> Somebody's got to be thanking God for that. Amen. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> but some of you are smarter than that. You go, yeah, we'll see. He's not done yet. <laughs> no, I will close it off by uh, finishing reading where we ended. And we'll close it there. I won't elaborate for the rest of it. He was well spoken. Of. By brethren who were Lystra and Iconium, Paul wanted to have him go on with him. And he took him. We will stop right there because if I read the next part, we are, I'm not going to describe that right now. We're not going to teach that part. But as I close this, interesting how Paul wanted to leave John Mark. Didn't want to take John Mark, but he wanted to take Timothy. 